Hello, friends. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good day. Hi, my name is Mia Park, and this is my interview series called In Response, Interviews with Intriguing Internalizers. So this interview series is my internal response to the outside world here on October 26, 2020. Um, <laughs> we've got global warming, intense climate change. There is the pandemic of racial injustice. We have the health pandemic of COVID-19. And here in America, in Chicago, where I am, we are very close to an important presidential election. So whew, it's a very exciting time to be alive. If you're a conscious person, it is not boring being alive right now. And I'm so excited to welcome a very insightful and very knowledgeable person about the world and many things. From right now, coming at us from the Philippines is Professor David Mason. So David and I know each other because David's a scholar in traditional Korean uh, religions, kind of spiritual practices. Also, uh, even deeper than that, um, within those like Korean shamanism, or Korean Buddhism, special knowledge in certain parts of those. Also, he uh, has taught in Korean universities for many, many, many years. And um, we know each other because I, I have academic studied Korean shamanism. I did an undergrad thesis on it. And I learned about Korean shamanism, shamanism when I lived in Korea in the early 1990s. And at that time, I found this amazing English book Book in English about Korean shamanism. And I thought, what it was, it's so cool. And that was written by Alan Koval. And so uh, I was going back to Korea at a certain point, and I thought, oh my gosh, I finally have time. When you go, if you're a Korean, you go back to Korea, you have like no time because you have to run around and see family, right? So I was in there one year and I was like, oh, I have time. I want to get back into this Korean shamanism. Looked up Alan Koval and couldn't find him anywhere in the world, but did find this amazing website from Professor David Mason. And it was about the Korean mountain god, Sanshin. And I was like, who's this white American guy that has this amazing website filled with all this knowledge? So I got in touch and I went to Korea and I met Professor Mason and it ends up that Alan Koval gave David all of his research at archives, right? From uh, the Korean shamanism that he even used to write the book that I read in the 90s, so full circle. So David right now is in the Philippines with his family, and it's a, it's a really big effort to leave the Philippines to go back to Korea, which is why he's there. But that's just to explain why you're not in Korea where you're normally are. So David, hello, welcome. How are you? Thanks, Mia. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm feeling good this morning. Feeling quite fine. I've been healthy for a long time, and that's always the greatest blessing. Uh, I've been sick for years. Ooh, I'm, gonna knock, I'm gonna knock some work for you. We're gonna have to do a cook for that Korean shamanistic ceremony, just so you know. <laughs> anyway, so David, is there anything else you'd like people to know about you? Well, just uh, I'm for a long time. I've been a professor of tourism. Very interested in tourism. They go from my. Uh, academic study that, that you've talked about, about not only shamanism, but uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, very much, uh, all the uh, Oriental spiritual traditions that are, or I should say East Asian spiritual traditions that uh, <laughs> are uh, fascinated me, but I've never been an ivory tower kind of scholar, uh, uh, just sitting with books and writing papers. I've I always wanted this to be a practical thing and get the, the knowledge about these things out to the world in a way that the world can experience and understand in a very clear way. And therefore, I got into the tourism field uh, way, way back in the 1988 Olympics uh, the, held by Seoul, Korea, uh, helping the tourism efforts then and forward. And I, just, I ended up as a professor of tourism, uh, cultural tourism in that spirit of getting this knowledge out to the world that people can experience in a practical way. Absolutely. And I do want to say that as David and I were talking before we went live, you know, you look at someone who is so knowledgeable about a culture that they're not a part of. And that kind of like 
can be very suspiciously cultural appropriation, um, especially uh, a white dude from America going to an East Asian country because that's just colonialism, you know, all over again, or this kind of imperialism. However, David's the real deal. Um, David is definitely a carrier of knowledge that many people in Korea either don't know or don't care about, honestly. So sometimes it takes an outsider with clean, fresh eyes and a genuine appreciation for that culture to preserve it, highlight it, and point out even special parts of it that people within it won't know. And that's what we call David an ally. So thank you for being an ally, preserving traditional Korean many things. Thank you. I've, I've tried to be that. Uh, in fact, I often, starting a lecture course at the beginning, the first class of a whole course, like on the history of Korean culture, with a fair amount of Koreans in the class, and as well as overseas Koreans, like Korean Americans, and then other international students. And I, I asked, you know, what the hell is a white guy from Birmingham, Michigan, doing teaching this class? Um, and I try to explain that. that. It's things that have fascinated me my whole life. I got deeply into them, and I explain it from a Westerner's perspective in a way that perhaps Westerners can understand, in a way that maybe the Korean students need to hear. The, the Korean students are going to go into the tourism business and therefore be presenting Korea to the, uh, the people of the world. They need to know a little, see an outsider perspective of what's interesting and what's unique about their, their culture, their history. It's my point of view. And I tell them, if you had a Korean professor teaching this class, you'd, you'd get a very different class. You sure would. And you'd get a, a Korean American teaching this class. You'd probably get quite a different story going. But I, I'm going to tell you my story, my point of view on it, and just take that for what it is. And if you had a Chinese or Japanese professor teaching this class, you'd get quite a different story. you got to get all these different stories and try to integrate them. For sure, for sure. So... Uh, can you explain to us what the outside world is for you right now and then share what your internal response is to that? Multiple things. Uh, physically, I'm, I'm here in the central Philippines in a nice tourist town, a tourist town where I fell in love with. I, I, I met my wife and she's from this town. And I met her uh, up in Manila, the big city, and uh, fell in love with her, and eventually we got married, and to perform the, the Catholic wedding ceremony, we came here to her old hometown, uh, which she wasn't much interested in, but I kind of fell in love with the town. Besides her, it was a very pleasant tourist town, and eventually we got the idea that I would retire here, and she would uh, return here and run a business as I uh, go into retirement, and uh, it's a really nice, pleasant place to be. And many other people discovered that uh, a few years after I did, there started to be a rush. And by now there's like 12,000 retired people in, in around the area of this city, 12,000 retired foreigners and only about 100,000 Filipinos. So um, it's, it's been a bit, uh, other people agree, this is, a great place to be. I've always kind of enjoyed vacationing in the tropics and then for retirement. And it's quite different from Korea, but there it is. Now, yeah. in, the, in the larger sense, I'm very much attuned. I'm a person who follows the news a lot, and that can be kind of soul polluting if you let it. Um, but uh, the whole world is in such a crisis these days. There's been such negativity and such emergency and in fact right now we're doing this interview it feels like things are kind of on the edge of a cliff coming up both in economic depression a possible you know economic collapse of sorts and a billion people in this world could start starving as well as uh, great political violence possible in america great disorder and a, a great damaging of the, the system of democracy which I have always loved all my life and always followed. I've always been a bit of a political follower. So seeing 
all this and then the the racial conflict which i mean i'm old enough i remember the 60s and martin luther king and the kind of partial victories attained then and i was among those who thought that during the 70s that this was all getting solved and uh, getting much better and uh, black people were getting into the elite and the middle class and uh things were opening up and people were less racist and and then came ronald reagan and then came what followed that and it is utterly disappointing to see how far we still are behind on racial issues in america and a lot around the rest of the world and that disturbs me deeply so i know thank you for sharing that and i know that you have tools that help you internally with this disturbance can you share what kind of toolkit you like to draw from yeah multiple well one of my first great loves as a teenager was the mountains uh big craggy rocky soaring mountain peaks with deep forested valleys you don't have that in michigan I grew up in Michigan, it was all flatland around the Midwest mostly. But when I first got to the Rocky Mountains and later the California Sierra, very, uh, the, the wilderness, and those great mountains, it was, it was very spiritual to me. I, I really agreed with John Muir that it's the true church, the real church, the cathedral, uh, places like our great national parks. And also I was fascinated with the East Asian religious traditions, spiritual traditions, as we've said, all of it really from Neo-Confucianism, Taoism, uh, Mahayana Buddhism to the shamanism uh, and such. And when I came to Korea, I discovered the perfect combination of both of those. Uh, great mountains, really rocky, craggy, impressive mountains, but they're really not too big, not too high. They're very benevolent mountains. They don't try to kill you. Um, if you're familiar with the great, very beautiful mountains of Alaska or the Himalayas, where people go, you'll understand what I mean. Those mountains are trying to kill you. They have the intention, and you're, you're lucky if you avoid injury. Even Korean mountains, very benevolent. That hardly any, they're not even poisonous snakes or spiders much to worry about. Uh, you don't slip and fall because they have good tread and they're not that high. You get to the peak and you get back down in time for dinner. They're not trying to kill you up there. And uh, beautiful, lovely, attractive mountains. And then finding within those mountains all the shaman shrines, Taoist places, and uh, Buddhist temples, Buddhist hermitages. Uh, in the big monasteries in the valleys below the peaks and then smaller hermitages up on the slopes. So the combat, uh, everything I was interested in was right there, uh, fascination. The mountains and the nature and the wilderness in combination with so much spiritual activity of multiple denominations, including Confucian shrines too, including Christian churches having their prayer camps up there. Uh, have a, a good place to find God in the deep valleys. Uh, they say uh, all uh, five or six different religions practicing in those mountains side by side together. And that's kind of unique in the world, actually, if you do a survey. And then finding the mountain spirit, Korea's Sanshin, mountain spirit that you mentioned, uh, that kind of encapsulates all of that. It represents the mountains, depicts the mountains, and the, the herbal uh herbal medicine available there the uh deep forests the great pine trees the animals and the wisdom the idea of wisdom of finding wisdom finding enlightenment in those mountains that really captured me at uh, 24 years old in 1982 and kind of became my personal spirituality and led to writing a book about it that made me a little bit famous in Korea, and uh, that became the, the book uh, Spirit of the Mountains, and uh, led to my website. And pretty much I've devoted my life to that, and it's where I do retreat to internally uh, as just kind of as a spiritual symbol. It's the spirit of the mountains, and I, I don't believe, you know, like literally in a mountain god walking around there, 
but uh, as it is a symbol of the interrelationship between human beings and nature, a wild nature, the mountain itself, having a relationship with human beings and uh, a, a very much responsive relationship of taking care of each other, um, including the ecological idea that if we keep the mountain and the forest healthy, they'll keep us healthy in the village at the bottom of the mountain. Uh, that's a very important principle that the modern world tends to forget with industrialization, but is more true than ever. Uh, if we care for nature and maintain the stability of the ecosystem, we stay healthy. And if we damage it, we get sick, we get injured, we lose our homes, uh, the, the climate change thing, all of that. So that means a lot to me. And I go back to that symbol and look at those paintings, bow in front of them still, and meditate and do some chanting just to keep that, that symbol of human harmony within the natural world, how important that is living in harmony as humans and having, having great power to preserve or to destroy the nature, having that power and having the consciousness to decide what to do with that power and just how important it is. And I keep really wishing for better results of this in the world, hoping for better results and contributing what I can to making yeah. things better, although it has not been going well. No, this world. That is so great. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that. That's beautiful. So do you think that that kind of uniqueness of the kind of mountains that are in Korea and what you find in those mountains from the different religious systems, is that unique? Is that kind of spirituality coexisting and the kind well, of, is that unique to Korea? It really is. I, I've been a student of religions of the world and uh, the incredible diversity. And especially I'm interested when religions kind of rub up against each other and have a combination, like in the Hagia Sophia uh, Cathedral. Oh my mosque. God, Hagia Sophia is one of my favorite places on the planet. I love that place. I agree with you. The Islamic heritage that took over the Christian church and they became a church again, they became a... Yes, yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. That, there's a great cathedral in Cordoba, Spain, that was also a synagogue for a while um, and still has the remains of the synagogue, the, some of the altars and artwork, and then the Muslim uh, overlay and then the Christian overlay. Now, there are very few places in the world that really combine two different religions where they like share a mountain together in some kind of harmony or share a belief. There's only three or four, maybe, places in the world where three religions distinctively share the heritage. In Korea, we're talking five or six at a single mountain like Jirisan, perhaps the holiest mountain of uh, South Korea. And that name, Jiri, it means exquisite wisdom, the mountain of exquisite wisdom. And five or six, depending on kind of how you count, um, religious and spiritual traditions share that mountain with more like a hundred religious sites all around its slopes, circling it. I've only managed to photograph about 85 of them, but I know there's more. I, it's around a hundred. It's and there's more being built every couple of years, which uh, just makes it more difficult for me. Um, I, I've got 75 pages about Jerry San just on my website, just about Jerry San. The whole website is now 1,100 pages or so about Korean spiritual sacred sites and spiritual traditions. But 75 pages just on Jerry San. I don't think there's any other mountain in the whole world like that. Hmm. It, at a place like, say, Taishan of China that has Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, all three very strong. Okay, all three. <laughs> But we're talking five or six, very strong. And there's just nothing like that. There's not even four somewhere to mm. make a competition as far as I've ever found. So I think Korea is really great with that. And the Sanshin paintings, which I hope people will go see on my website, there are just hundreds of them available. They combine at three or four or five 
spiritual traditions in one artwork. There's Taoism, Neo-Confucianism, uh, Shamanism, and Buddhism, all represented by various different symbols. Now, this is what my book was about, and such, as well as Korean kind of a spiritual nationalism you could talk about, that uh, it all combined in one artwork, one painting. And there's nothing else like that in the entire religious world that I am aware of. So, yeah, I think it's just amazing. And this has fascinated me for 40 years, <laughs> 38 years. And it became my life. I built a career and a life centered around that, which was never yeah. financially successful, but uh, been very fulfilling, I would say. Oh, and, and again, as a Korean American, I have learned so much uh, about traditional Korean things there. From you, I've met with David in Seoul at least three times over the last, I don't know how many years, over 10 years, I think. And uh, and uh, you can, it, when the world gets back to where David can get back to Korea, and you can too, take David's walking tours of Jidisan and these places right in the middle of Seoul. So it's not a far stretch if you're in Seoul. And it's David's wealth of knowledge is just amazing. You're walking around and he's pointing out these incredible rocks or this this place that meant that and this painting that means that. And if I had foresight, I've got your books up there on my shelf. I should have grabbed your books and been like, here's this book on Buddhism. This is like repeating, here's this, here's the Spirit of the Mountain book. I have them there. Um, but there is a link to David's website. So if you are a person who is interested in any of those spiritual systems he mentioned, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, shamanism, um, take a look at David's website. Again, the link's there so you can understand the Korean practices of those. So what you just said asked, wants me to ask you two more questions. And I know I started this interview out before saying like, I want to hear about you, the person, but it's so delightful to talk to you because you know so much. So if I can beg you for a little more information, two things. First question, why do you think, because Koreans are super religious. Like, like the, for an example, when or they, there's a, there's a definite searching of Korean people into connecting with higher beings like God, like when that awful high school the tragedy of the ship that sank with all the high school kids in it, and that was tied back to some weird Christian cult. So that's one angle of that. The other was where was the president? She was in some kind of pseudo shamanistic ceremony, and nobody could get a hold of her. So just two weird references about how spiritual Koreans are. I'm wondering why you think that is. The other thing, question, is that we talk about the mountains and the beauty of the mountains and how much is there, and Korea is cut in half. So even the Korean national anthem talks about Baekdusan, which is a very spiritual mountain, which is in North Korea that very few people can access. I'm wondering what you think about what might be happening to the spiritual practices or spirituality that may live in those mountains in North Korea that people you know probably aren't allowed to practice up there so two big questions yeah okay okay uh first of all, i think koreans are very spiritual minded and this goes all the way to from older generation believing a lot of just sheer superstition uh, folklore superstition things uh all the way to being involved pretty closely in more modern religions uh heavily uh, but only half the population, do keep in mind, belongs to any particular faith or religion, would declare themselves a member of anything, uh, primarily uh, majority Christian out of that half, and then Buddhist, and then a bunch of minorities, including cults. It tends that that's because membership in a religion tends to become a, an obsessive thing for Koreans. They don't take it casually. Uh, it becomes kind of obsessive and consumes your life. If you're a Korean Christian, you spend all your time with the uh, the church and its members, all your free time, um, and donate a lot of money to them too. So uh, there's a fair amount of people that uh, avoid that simply. They don't want their life taken over by membership and by becoming disciple of a guru type of minister or Buddhist monk or whatever, um, but then they still have a lot of, say, spiritual belief and spiritual interest. They think the, the spiritual life, the spiritual world means something and that there's more than the physical world. 
I think there's only a relatively few pure scientific atheists in Korea, but half the population is not a member of something. Mm -hmm. I think there's a whole lot of mixture and combination that reminds me very much when I went to California in 1978, and for a few years, I was experiencing the first flowering of what's called the, the New Age, the, the California New Age. It came up in New York and California. The, the kind of combination of things like yoga, Zen meditation, health food, herbal medicine, and uh, Hindu spirituality, and uh, Buddhist uh, uh, thing, uh, mixed and uh, Taoist ideas, reading the Tao Te Ching, uh, uh, such um, mixing those things together with like tarot cards and astrology, mixing it together, and people would just pick and choose what mm -hmm. they wanted out of that. And mm -hmm. uh, there's still a very strong New Age mentality all over the United States where people may... Let's uh, come back to Korea. But, so I was just uh, wondering, yeah. So uh, there's all that. And uh, uh, Korea's got a lot of people who are really like that, who pick and choose. Uh, they'll say they believe in God and heaven, and they'll bow to the mountain spirits, and they'll do uh, some Buddhist or yogic practices and make their own way out of it. <clears throat> and that feels natural and comfortable to me. I, I deal well with this combination feeling, and like you don't have to exclusively choose the way okay. that fundamentalists would insist. Yeah. Um, so I think Korea, in summation, is a really fascinating country to study religions in. And I've told that to many graduate students and mentored them in this way, to study religion, especially how it's evolving in the modern world. I think Korea is kind of at the forefront of uh, developing new ways of, of spirituality out of combination of global trends. Now, uh, the second uh, thing was uh, the mountains. The mountains in North Korea, because we ah. acknowledge that, I, I, and the two questions are kind of related. Again, I understand the Korean people to generally be very interested in and dedicated towards spiritual practices, whatever that looks like. And that includes North Koreans. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously North Korea is the only communist theocracy in the world right now where they believe that the leaders are divine and not a merely human, that whole family. So you talked earlier about how spirituality lives in Korean mountains. And I wonder mm -hmm. what you think is happening to like Pekdusan or these other really special well, mountains in North Korea? 20 years ago, I would have told you, we really have no idea. But by now we really do, because a lot of people have been to Korea, professors and like my friend, the professional mountain man, uh, Roger Shepard, a great pioneer, had been to North Korea 20 times, uh, exploring and taking photos in the mountains. And he's gotten to see quite a lot of, so now we do know. Okay, the when that communist regime took over in 1945 and further and through the Korean War, it was really bad for religions and spirituality. They killed many religious people, monks and uh, uh, Christians who would not submit and shamans. Um, and what you and just this, said was my grandfather. My mother's family escaped from North Korea because they were going to kill her father because he wouldn't convert from Christianity. You refuse to give up or even fake give up God. Yes. And that's why yes. they fled. So, yes. So, this is a huge event in all of Korean spiritual history because uh, North Korea, Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, was actually the Christian center of all Korea before that. During the colonial era from the American missionaries, Pyongyang was like 90% Christian. It was called the, the New Jerusalem of East Asia. Um, uh, the missionaries were so happy. The whole city was Christian, and they had the greatest churches and ministers and theological college and, and such. Now, when the communists took over, that was shattered, and so many of the hardcore Christian ministers came south. They came south back uh, for five years and through the war. Sometimes you could cross the DMZ border, and they did. And they came to South Korea and really energized South Korean uh christianity until today and the shamanism south north korean shamanism is quite different from south korean shamanism much more dynamic and colorful and 
uh, live action possession, possession by spirits, which the South didn't have much, but then North Korean shamans, so many of them came to South Korea and started setting up and practicing, and it totally changed the nature of South Korean shamanism. It basically took over um, and still flourishing today and the greatest shaman, shamans and then their disciples of South Korea have their roots from the North. Uh, look on my website for some examples like Madame Kim Kung Hwa, mm -hmm. known as the grandmother of all shamans. Yeah, she's still South Korea, Came from the North at 15 years old as a refugee. And also Buddhist, Buddhist monks came from the North and settled in the South and provided more energizing. Now, the mountains in the North, out of all the, let's say the 33 most sacred mountains of all the Korean peninsula that I have identified traditionally, five of them are in North Korea. Five of them. Uh, they, the South always had the largest population and the most activity all through history. The North is much more mountainous, filled with mountains, has uh, still today only half the population of the South. So the five great mountains up there, including Bektusan, you mentioned, including the famous Diamond Mountains, uh, Gungangsan, some of the most beautiful mountains in the world, people say. Uh, those are in North Korea. They used to be great religious centers. They were emptied out, both by the communists uh, the, driving them out, killing people, driving them south, and also during the Korean War, the American Air Force relentlessly bombing pretty much any building they could find and destroying those old temples, totally, and the shaman shrine complexes bombed all the hell, everything. Now, in Reconstruction, just in pride of their national history, North Koreans rebuilt uh, the most famous temples, all the rest they just left in ruins, but they rebuilt the most famous of them, uh, two or three dozen perhaps, and used them as national historical sites. North Koreans go visit them for history and like have a picnic around there. They are generally empty of artworks and empty of uh, uh, monks, any kind of practicing monks. There are only kind of fake monks run by the Communist Party that accept donations, similar to a lot of sites in China. Um, just the money goes to the party. Um, the, uh, there's not an authentic spirituality happening there. What people do in private, we hear that people do sneak off to the mountains to do ceremonies for the mountain spirit or other spirit, the dragon spirits, other things trying to get good fortune but it's not common and it's very secretive because if, if you get caught doing it, you're punished and uh, severe punishment, terrible. So it's largely killed out. A lot of the younger generation of North Koreans probably don't even know anything about this. But one thing that has fascinated me is that in these rebuilt temples and other kind of shrine areas, the North Korean authorities have had modern artists recreate mountain spirit paintings, as well as re-putting in, you know, some of the old Buddha statues, uh, reconstructing them and having some basic things in some of the temples for just for tourism visiting purpose. But there are mountain spirit paintings that have obviously have been, uh, I've seen no antiques, but have obviously been painted within the last 20, 30 years by artists. And even uh, my friend Roger was able to buy one of them from an artist and bring it back to South Korea. That's a real treasure, a North Korean mountain spirit painting. They look a lot like the older South Korean ones. They're just doing it uh, on tradition, but they are doing that, having a painting and installing there. And some of them have candles in front of them, candlesticks. So I assume that North Korean people are being allowed to go in there and uh, can bow to the mountains and they bow and give a prayer. And it's something because the mountain spirit is just so very Korean and the North Korean regime is no longer any kind of communist or Marxist thing. It hasn't been for decades, but it's extremely Korean nationalist. They have the strongest nationalism that kind of bleeds into a fascist racism, really, uh, about pure blood people being superior. And so, but they're so nationalistic and the mountain spirit, they kind of recognize that that's Korean culture. That's uniquely mm -hmm. Korean. That's really mm -hmm. deeply Korean. 
So apparently we can't not allow that. Mm. And even when South Korean Buddhists were allowed to come to the north, to the Diamond Mountains in 2002, and rebuild one of the great Buddhist temples there, Shingesa. They rebuilt it in a beautiful way with South Korean money. This is when the two sides were getting along much better under President Kim Dae-jung. And they held a mountain spirit ceremony. They installed a mountain spirit painting and held a whole ceremony of the mountain spirit before starting construction, which is spiritually important. And the North Korean authorities said, yeah, sure, go ahead, no problem. Even though they don't allow such things to happen generally in mm. their country. That. So uh, photos of that are on my website of that ceremony and of some of the other uh, mountain spirit paintings that have been found in the north. And I do have section on my website about North Korea showing these holy mountains and the temples that now exist there. And sometimes some old photos from the 1920s or 30s mm. that used to be there. I do believe that when North Korea is liberated someday and there's something we just all pray for long term and Koreans can unite and get that country back together as hopefully, hopefully a form of democracy with basic human rights installed, although it's, it's never going to be Norway or anything, but it's uh, when they do get it together, spirituality will flow back into North Korea. And I think the people there will be very receptive, mm. Korean Christians and Buddhists, and certainly have plans. They've made plans for decades of the trucks and the artworks and the printed Bibles or Buddhist scriptures. Then the, the, the missionary monks are going to bring up north as fast as they can and try to get the bit. And I'm sure Korean shamans, Korean shamans will find their way back to those beautiful, important, sacred mountains begin practicing, begin getting clients uh, again, and reviving that sense, I think it will be revived. And as far as the English language promotion of the world of all of this goes, I, I hope to live long enough to be a part of that and show the world what's happening with it and be able to explain it. Uh, wow, you, know. you have, again, you have been such a, a great ally you have, uh, again, being such a great ally to the Korean culture, really, especially to the spiritual practices of Korean people. Um, I, it would be wonderful when that Korean unification happens and the spiritual um, results of that would be so fascinating. And you, I don't even know if you or I will be alive when that happens with the state of the world right now in North and South Korea, but you know, um, my lips to the mountain god's ears. But um, this has just been so wonderful and interesting. So friends, listening on the podcast and watching during this live video interview, you can see how fascinating David Mason is. Um, so make sure you check out his website. The so links are around here. And uh, really read about it. It's very fascinating, all this interesting information that he has. Um, there are a couple comments from people. Michael uh, Patrick Monahan says, hello, David. And somebody named Andy Omar says, I like your shirt, David. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a tropical shirt here in the Philippines. I he's actually asking of... you out. Dave, do you want a date? <laughs> yeah, Andy, he's taken. He's a father and he's got a wife. So, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always thought Filipinos were real cute. And I found mm. a really good one. Well, Alas, indeed, and yeah, we we expats here. We we it's a bit cartoonish that we're kind of fitting the stereotype of wearing a Hawaiian kind of tropical shirt as we go around town here. But it, we we know we're not Filipinos. We're expats here. We're just enjoying and uh, contributing, yeah, uh, being being friends with them. I'm sure. Well, and hello, Mike. Hello, Mike. I'm glad you could tune in. He's an old friend. Oh, that's nice. Thank you, Michael, for watching. And thanks for everybody else for watching and listening. So, David, thank you again so much. You honor me. You honor everybody with your knowledge and sincerity. And mm -hmm. um, again, everybody watching, if you enjoyed this interview, uh, there are so many like this already on my website, meopark.com, and more coming. But this one with David is very special and near and dear to me because we're 
friends bonded over Korean spirituality and, and the nature of Korea. So again, if when the world opens up again and you can get to South Korea when David's there, definitely take one of his walking tours. It is a unique experience of Korea that you will never get unless you do that. So thanks so much, for David. Thanks for watching, everyone. And if you enjoy this series, you can become a patron of me and my team and the In Response series at patreon.com slash park. You can do that and start with a dollar a month. It'd be really great to have your support. So thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, David. Bye. Thank you.